We're in, uh, going through the letter of, uh, uh, from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church. And uh, I wish I could say I set this up on purpose. We're just kind of taking this a chapter at a time. But uh, this is kind of serendipitous. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Uh, Paul's kind of addressing a challenge. The believers in Corinth had just kind of taken their culture and the way they lived, and they just added a cross to it. It was more decorative than it was uh, defining. And it really didn't challenge the way that they did things. And, and that created another set of challenges that Paul tries to deal with. One of the challenges in that Corinthian culture is that financial status and success was a really big deal. There were a lot of wealthy people there. And in fact, Corinth was the city you would go to if you wanted to become upwardly mobile in the culture. They began to equate, if you did really well financially, then you must be very spiritual because they perceived that that was how God blessed you. And so if you were very wealthy, then you must be a... Uh, a person who had a lot of knowledge. You must be a very spiritual person, and you could actually help other people become more spiritual too. And what Paul wanted them to know is that there's a difference between being an authority on something and having authority. We all know people who think they are authority. It happened to me just a couple weeks ago. We were in the, uh, lunch, in the kitchen having a, a staff lunch, and it was during the time of the NBA basketball championships, and, and I started to weigh in on one particular player. And at one point, I actually said something where three mouths opened around the table and nothing came out. And I thought to myself, I've either said something very profound or very stupid. <laughs> and I think you know which one it was. Just because someone speaks with confidence, or even if they have data and information, they can be an authority on something. But Paul, he wasn't there just to be able to quote scripture or make incredibly strong arguments. When he came into a community, people began to discover the incredible grace and greatness of God. And leaders were trained and equipped for ministry. And people were ministered to in the power of the Holy Spirit. He, didn't, he wasn't just an authority. He had authority. But the Corinthian church started to lose their confidence in Paul, and it's because of their culture. In their culture, success equaled spirituality, and Paul was struggling. Paul had difficulties. Paul was going through difficult times. And by the way, Paul was not the most exciting preacher or speaker to listen to. He shared incredible content, but you could get a little bored with his style. And so Paul is concerned. It's one of the reasons why he writes to them, and it's not because he's worried he's losing his status among them. He's just deeply concerned that if they continue processing their spiritual life like this, that they're going to stunt their spiritual growth. There's some things they will never grow into. So they were very suspicious of Paul's authority because he doesn't have a lot of money and he isn't a very compelling speaker. And they just start listing all the things. They said, maybe he doesn't have much authority at all. And uh, that culture actually was very suspicious of authority. They love celebrity. They were very suspicious of authority, which is why I think this is such a powerful letter for us to read in our culture, because I think our culture loves celebrity and is very suspicious of authority. Jesus actually weighed in on this. He told us there's a difference between authority and authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is when somebody enforces strict obedience at the expense of the person who has to do the obeying. There's a lack of concern completely when it comes to the health or the concerns of others. All that matters is that someone obeys completely, so you get a lot of domineering and dictatorial leadership that way. And Jesus said that's not how the kingdom works. In fact, this is what he says in Matthew 20. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. That's not how it works in the kingdom. Look at what else he says. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
our culture is a little bit apprehensive about authority, and we have a hard time distinguishing between authority and authoritarianism. So what the first point is I want to make today is that authority is absolutely necessary if you want to thrive. We need authority in our life. Now, I can give you an example. Uh, let's suppose that there's a group of musicians and vocalists who all get together. And let's suppose that they all have the instruments that they prefer to play. They all have the songs that they prefer to sing. They all have the arrangements that they prefer to use. And so everybody walks up on the stage with their own instrument and their own song and their own arrangements, and they just start playing. It is not going to be very pretty. As talented as they may be individually, it will be a disaster as a corporate effort because each one is doing their own thing. You have to come under some authority. So there'll be one song. You come under the uh, authority of a single song. And you may come under the authority of a band director or orchestral or leader so that there's a kind of, of, of everyone doing the thing together. And this is what's fascinating. When they come under that kind of authority, not only do they flourish as a group, they actually flourish individually. This is what Paul wants us to understand. We need authority in our lives if we're going to thrive. Now, even in our culture, we will even pay for authority sometimes. If you feel like you're not in shape or like you, you need some help on, on losing a couple pounds, you might even pay for a trainer. You can pay for a life coach. I mean, maybe you were smart to get into college and they paid you to go there, but I had to pay for my professors. That's just how it works. We actually pay to bring authority into our lives. In fact, there's actually no such thing as an authority vacuum. There is no space in our culture or our world where there's an absence of authority. There can be good authority or bad authority. There can be external authority or internal authority. But always there's someone who's in charge who's calling the shots. The question is who? And some people will only listen to the authority that they possess. They don't trust anybody else's. I have in my pocket a little device. Does anybody have one of these? It's a smartphone, and it actually makes you smarter. You don't believe me? Okay. But this particular smartphone is an iPhone, and there's a guy who, who kind of created the company that makes all these products, and his name was Steve Jobs, and he was an incredibly bright talented, intelligent, gifted individual who found incredible ways to make technology available, accessible, and usable by individuals. And his commitment was not that you would just be able to have access to it, but that it would be elegant, and it would be artful, and it would be beautiful. And he did really, really well in his life. He was a legitimate authority when it came to iPhones, iPads, iPods, Mac computers, all of that. There's another thing that occurred in his life, though. It had nothing to do with technology. He was actually diagnosed with a very rare form of pancreatic cancer. What made this so interesting is that his particular rare form of pancreatic cancer was treatable, and in fact, most people would survive it if you caught it early enough and if you had surgery. And they had caught it early enough, and they recommended to Steve Jobs that he would have the surgery. But he didn't want to have the surgery. He didn't want the procedure. He didn't want to be opened up. He was fearful of it. And so he decided that if he had the intellect, the capacity to make technology available to anyone, he could apply his intellect to this arena, and he would figure out a solution. And so he became an expert in all kinds of dietary concerns, restrictions. In fact, he had one of the strictest diets you can possibly imagine. He went through all of these processes of cleansing out his body. I mean, it was unbelievable. And what happened was, is the cancer continued to grow. Now, it wasn't a lack of discipline. In fact, you couldn't find a person who was more disciplined to this process than Steve Jobs was. The problem was not a lack of discipline. The problem was, is that he would not submit to the authority of someone who actually knew how to take care of this. Steve Jobs actually didn't die from pancreatic cancer. Steve Jobs died because he wouldn't submit to authority. And you know what? He's not alone in that. Every single one of us in this room can have examples like that in our lives, where there is someone who actually does know better, and they're trying to help us, and we are resisting the concept simply because 
we don't want to, we don't feel comfortable with it, or we think we know better. And it might not cost us our physical life, but it can cost us our hopes, it can cost us our dreams, it can cost us our relationships, it can cost us sometimes marriages, it can cost us careers. There's all kinds of things that can die when we choose to operate only on our own authority. As a rule, the only authority we like is the authority we possess. And there's a reason for that. And it's actually a challenging reason because we would prefer to call the shots in our life. We would prefer to, to make the decisions in our life. We want to make the judgments in our life. We want to be in control. It's a little way where we're trying to play God. And this is what I want you to know. Paul says it doesn't work. That's why he starts talking to them about authority, but he, he, he wades into this. He doesn't say, look, I planted this church. You're going to do what I say. He didn't say, I've got more theological training than anybody else. You're going to do what I say. He actually asked them to consider his authority based on the relationship that he has with them. And that's what he says. If you may have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. I am your father through the gospel. This is not one of those moments where he's trying to do like Darth Vader. <sighs> Luke, I am your father. That's not what it is. This is not one of the things where they're going, oh, no. This is not what it is. He's calling them to remember what the nature of the relationship is. And back in that day, it was very common for children that were raised in their father's home to often pick up not just the habits and the tendencies of the fathers, but even their vocations. And so Paul understood this was a really powerful model to help them understand. So what does healthy authority look like? And the first thing is it flows out of love. Healthy authority flows out of love. It's not always a feeling, but it's an incredibly strong commitment to that person's well-being. He actually says in that chapter, he, he refers to them as dear children. This was not a line, as long as you live in my house, you're going to do what I say. That's not what he's saying. He's expressing how incredibly precious they are to him. So he, said, he establishes, the reason I want to exercise authority in your life is because I love you. You are my dear children. The second healthy uh, concept of healthy authority is that it's willing to serve. Healthy authority is willing to serve. See, we don't think like this. We think health authority uh, bosses people around. But he says it's willing to serve. In fact, he actually makes this point in the first verse of, of chapter 4. He says, this is how you should regard us as, what's the next word? Servants. As servants. How many parents do we have in the room? How many know? When you become a parent, you become a servant. <laughs> it's true. You bring that little bundle of joy home, and you can tell them all you want. You say, okay. The kitchen will be open between 7 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. And I prefer that that's when we do all of our feeding. And by the way, we'll have a schedule for your bathroom needs. And uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're just going to start going off because they're either hungry or they need to be changed. And you can walk in and remind them of the schedule. <laughs> that's not going to work. You as the head of your home, are going to be taking off and cleaning up stinky diapers. You're going to be heating up bottles in the microwave. You're going to be staggering around the house in the middle of the night, sleep deprived as though you're some kind of a zombie and nothing bit you. You just have a baby. That's how it is. You serve the... And, by, and I wish I could tell you that goes away when they're potty trained and they can go to the fridge and get their own snack. But then they go into sports. Now they need to be at this game and that practice and all this stuff. And you just, you, you, I said it. I, I feel like I'm a taxi driver. Why don't I just paint my car yellow and stay in I'm just, you just feel like that. This is what real authority, why do you do that? Why do you serve the needs of your children? It's because you love them. That's why you love them. You're willing to serve. The third thing about healthy authority is it's able to model able to model. Real healthy authority doesn't say, just do what I say, not as I do. Real authority sometimes doesn't even need to say it because it's just doing it and you learn by observation. This is what he said. 
Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself for your benefit. I applied these things to myself for your benefit. Paul is modeling. He's not saying, I don't have to do that because of who I am, but you do. He's actually modeling it. And then the fourth uh, kind of identification of a healthy authority is that it looks to warn rather than to shame. It looks to warn rather than to shame. This is what he says in the same chapter. I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you, warn you, my dear children. See, shame is a huge influence in our culture, and shame is not just calling someone on a mistake. You can feel guilty about something, and you'll think, I did a, a bad thing. But when you feel shame, you feel like you're a bad person. And Paul says, I didn't come to shame you. That's not the tactic that I'm going to use. I want to warn you so that you don't have to go through some unnecessary pain. But, and I want to help you when you actually do experience failure. But the goal is not to put a guilt trip on you or manipulate you or to make you feel ashamed. The goal is actually warning. And here's what I think. I actually think parents could punish a lot less if they just allowed natural consequences to occur. How many, we have, a, we have a, a, a concept in our culture now, it's called helicopter parenting. And that is when that child, no matter where they go, their parent is right here. And whatever the child's gonna do, they intervene. And if anything's gonna hurt, they stop. And they just, and, and by the way, this thing lasts all the way into college. It's amazing. And, and I wonder sometimes, if when you have given wisdom and you've given warning and the natural consequence occurs, instead of protecting all the time, we just let it occur. Because then it's not you punishing. It's just, well, that's what happens when we approach it that way. What are some things that we can learn from this? That's a very different conversation, which leads us to this point. It strives to teach rather than to control. <laughs> Parenting is not about your ability to control your child. That's an illusion. You cannot control your child. You can't. You can't even control your pets. <laughs> you sure can't control your spouse. You can't control your friends. You can't control your neighbors. You can't control your coworkers. You have a hard time controlling yourself. Sometimes you don't even feel like you can do that. You are not in control. That is not how it works. The goal is not to control your child. The goal is to teach your child. And lots of parents feel like failures because their children reject their values or reject their instruction. But the evidence of a successful parent is not necessarily the decision a child makes. See, if we think it is, Say, well, and this is the problem. I, let's just be brutally honest. There were times when my kids did things, and the first thought was, oh, that's not good for them. My first thought was, oh, what kind of parent do people think I am? I mean, maybe I'm the only one that happened to, but it happened to me more than once. Isn't that sometimes why we get our most frustrated? They're going to think I'm a terrible parent. So if your ability to control your child determines your parental ability, what does that say about our Heavenly Father? Because last time I checked, he is not controlling all of our behavior. He warns, he teaches, he loves, he serves. And when you mess it up, he'll help you work it out. But this idea that parenting is about exercising all of this control, you will go crazy trying to do that. And when you're trying to control and, and, and your children are not uh, submitting to that kind of control, then that's when we're all the more tempted to start using the shaming option. But this is what I want you to know. When our children are going through difficult times, whether it's because of a misstep or whether it's just because this is a season of life that they're in and things are not working out for them, it's very important for them to know that God has not abandoned them and God can work in the midst of this. In fact, God does some of his best work in challenging places. This is, this is what Paul starts talking about now. And actually, it's astonishing that he would actually go this far in the conversation with Corinthians because if they don't buy into 
his relationship based on love and serving. At this point, they're going to cut him off completely because he, he says, you think if I'm going through a hard time, I'm not spiritually stable? This is what he starts telling him. Now look at this. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become, <laughs> can you believe he says this? We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. What an astonishing thing for him to say. Why is it so important that he make this point? Is he just trying to say, I know it's bad for me, but I want you to like me anyway? No. What he's saying is, when you're going through those kinds of situations, it is not evidence that your heavenly Father has left you. It is not evidence that he's angry with you. In fact, he is at work in the midst of all of this, and the lessons you are going to learn in this next season of your life are going to serve you well all the days of your life. That's what he wants to drive home. If we try to avoid all the challenges of life, there are some things we will never learn. You don't have to seek them out. Life will bring its own set of challenges. I mean, have you ever noticed this? We're attracted to movies where the star of the movie or the protagonist of a story has had to overcome some incredible diversity, adversity. They, they just... They're, all kinds of weight is placed upon them. The situation seems hopeless. Their resources are running out. They're ready to give up. And somehow they find the strength to take one more step. And when they do, we just cheer them on. But we only want to see that on a screen. We don't want to live that in our life. Just no, 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 no. I don't want, no, no. I want my life to be a boring story of everything's wonderful. Why are we attracted on a screen to something we would never want in our own life? And here's the thing. If, if you live that kind of life where you only will accept what is good, then you should know that doesn't produce the greatest personalities. Um, more, than, more than any of that, when a person is protected from all the uncomfortable parts of life, they become a tyrant. They become their own authority. Everything is always someone else's fault. And they rant and they rage until someone fixes the problem for them. They are in control. And the only authority they will accept is their own. And it's just a matter of time before something like a rare example happens to them. We're called to embrace a very different kind of authority. It's God's authority. And this is what's fascinating. The ultimate authority in the universe laid down his authority so that others might thrive. While our tendency is to grasp authority so that we can be in control, God, who has all authority, set it aside so that we would be benefited. And when we submit to his authority, that's when we begin to walk in that authority. The authority that he places in our life is about being a benefit and a blessing to others. So here's the point that I want to finish with. You don't have to live in fear of authority when you know the source of ultimate authority. See, when you see author authoritarianism, you're able to call it out because you know what real authority is. And you're not afraid of what someone might do to you, even if they impose pain and punishment on you. God is still with you. He will guide you through this. You will learn amazing things, and you will be benefited and blessed because of it. This is what it says about Jesus. Most astonishing thing. Jesus knew 
that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He knows he has all authority. He has all power. So what's he going to do now? What does the God who has all authority and all power do? What's his next step? He got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing. He wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus is kingly and meek. He is holy and humble. He is courageous and compassionate. He is infinite power, and he is completely vulnerable. He has mercy, but he does not abandon justice, and it is exactly why we are attracted to him, because his authority is real, and it is healthy. He has all authority, and you would think the one with all authority is the one who's going to be the harshest on us, and he is the very one that introduces us to grace. He does not hide the truth from us. He does not hide the truth about us, but he's willing to pay the price for our punishment because he didn't come to shame us and he didn't come to punish us. He came to redeem us and to teach us so that we can live in the authority he has for us. Can't you trust an authority like that? Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, this is hard for us because our, our culture doesn't train us well on this. We're, we're very suspicious of any authority. And your word doesn't ask us just to accept all things with a blind eye. Your word teaches us to discern the difference. I ask that you would help us today. Um, we still have time. We still have lives to live. We still have children to raise and grandchildren to love. And we would, we would love for your authority to not only be in control of our lives, but that it would flow through our lives. That we wouldn't have to power up. That obedience would not come because we're the loudest or we're the strongest, but because they've seen the evidence of our love. That would be a wonderful thing. And we ask that you do that for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.